Roger Cook. Roger Greenaway. Two Rogers. Cook and Greenaway. Great British songwriters. Good morning, world. It's a brand new day. After Lennon and McCartney, what's been regarded as the most successful songwriting team in the world. Something's got in the hold of my heart. They've had phenomenal success. A thousand songs, 70 hits. <laughs> I like to teach you what sing. What a beautiful dream. If it could only come true, you know, you know. Something tells me something's gonna happen. Frederick Roger Cook here. That was what I was born as. And I've been alive for about, I don't know, five minutes. My mother said he looks more like a Roger. My name's Roger Greenaway, and I was born at Southmead Hospital in Bristol in 1938, and just a year before the war started. I was born in Fishbonds, Bristol, just as the war started. And Hitler tried to bomb me in the hell, but he didn't make it, so I'm still here. Growing up was great. My dad was a musician. He played anything he put his hands on, but mainly piano and fiddle and banjo. So I had a background of music already, and we all sang when we were growing up, all siblings. We had those magic evenings where we sat down and Dad played, and we sang along with him, like something out of a movie. I grew up at a very happy childhood. My mum and dad were just fantastic. My sister was born five years later, joined the local football club, Sandwell Football Club, and whilst playing for them, I was spotted by a, a scout from Bristol City. So by the time I was 16, I was signed by Bristol City, and I played for a couple of seasons in their uh, Colts team. Johnny Attio was my hero and of course I trained with him once or twice but he played for England. He was a centre forward Johnny Attio. John Attio who shoots and he's made it. A goal with almost his first kick in an English shirt. Although my dream was to play football for England that uh, singing was probably a better choice for me. Blue skies around the corner Walk around the corner with me Well, my father wanted me to be into music. He had me learn violin for about two years of school, and then I got so fed up with guys picking on me, playing a bloody violin. I gave up the fiddle in the end, which really disappointed him. But I had a cousin who was a principal baritone with the Doyle Card Opera Company, singing Gilbert and Sullivan. And my father had a deep wish, too, that I would become a baritone and get a job like that one day. So I had to have singing lessons as well, which actually was a good thing because it's still been in good stead over the years. So thank you, Dad, for that. But again, I didn't want to be an opera singer. Then out of the blue one day, you hear a wop ba ba loo la As soon as I heard Little Richard in 1957, it was all over. I knew what I wanted to do. I remember my dad having this radiogram delivered, which was a radio with a record player inside it. And then I heard... Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lone Street, that heartbreak hotel. And that was it for me. I had a record player eventually in my bedroom, and I would be playing some rock and roll records, and my dad would shout at the stairs, Roger, turn off that noise! <laughs> he did not like that kind of music. My father heard me listening to Little Richard one day, and he said, that's not bloody music, son. I said, no, but it's good, isn't it, Dad? He said, no. He hated it. And early Elvis, the early Elvis stuff was great on Sun Records. There was no going back. It would be so lonely they could die. I'm Harry Barter. I've been in the music business for 60 years and I've made my living by discovering talent and making independent records. The first time I met Roger Cook, he was in a vocal group in a little hall in Long Ashton and he was there with a doo-wop band, the Sapphires. We were all in little bands. I was in the doo-wop group. The Sapphires. So we have one guitar and five singers. Funny enough, the guitarist wrote a song one day for the girl singer in the group to sing. This was 1958. And I was so bloody jealous. I thought, if he can write a song for her, I can write a song. So I went home and wrote a song. This was 1958. And I thought, well, that's pretty bloody easy. I started writing at least a song a week from then on. Well, he was more of a doo-wop artist. And so was Roger Greenaway. Like Roger Greenaway, come on at the Hippodrome and go, My baby, I need you, be my girl, and all this stuff, and it's all doo-wop. By then, I'd 
started work at ESNA Robinson's in Bristol, which was a paper manufacturing company, where I met Roger Max and Tony Burroughs. They used to sing together, and I decided one day I'd harmonise with them. Roger Max said, we make a great sound, don't we? And that's how the Kestrel started. Don't want to cry, but I'm going to this, this goodbye. And I'm going to leave this town and forget that I know your thrill. They had places underneath Robinson's in the basement and we used to go down and practice. We found that people liked it because the girls used to come down and listen to us singing in the basement. And we thought, oh, yeah, this is good. Roger Max, who was the leader at the time, remembered a guy he was at school with called Jeff Williams who had a very high falsetto voice. Roger co-opted him into the group so there were the four kestrels. So slowly but surely we started to make a name for ourselves. And then a guy called Carol Evers, who was the original Simon Cow, he would roam the country looking for talent. Then he would go to the local theatres and they'd pick about six acts. So you'd have five nights of six acts. Whoever won in their heat would go on to the Saturday night show. So there would be six winners on the Saturday night show. Well, we won our heat, as did Roger Cook, by the way, in his group called the Sapphires. He won his seat too. And we met up in the final on the Saturday night at Bristol Hippodrome. We got up and sang. We thought we were pretty good. And then the Kefsels came out and just blew us away. They were so damn good. They were like professionals. And we won. But I know I will. We worked in Germany for six months to hone our act. And when we came back, Roger Max, he decided that showbiz wasn't for him. We had to find a replacement. And Johnny Keating, who we'd been working with at the time, a band leader, recommended a friend of his from Edinburgh, a guy called Peter Gunnan. Peter joined the group and uh, he was with us for about two years and then he decided that he wanted to go solo, which he did. And I remembered Roger at the time. And I said to the guys, look, do you remember Roger Cook? He used to sing the Sapphires. And they said, yeah. I said, why don't we call him? I don't know what he's doing, but why don't we call him and see if he can join the group? Because he had a great voice. I was in a pantomime in 1963 at Cardiff. I was playing the Sheriff of Nottingham and Mike and Bernie Winters were the robbers. I get this call from Arthur Parton. He said, Roger Greeno has been trying to get in touch with you. One of the boys is leading the Kestrels, and he thinks you'd fit in really nicely. And I thought, yes, yes, I want to get back to being in a band. So when the show finished up, I joined Roger, and we went straight on tour. We were about to do a six-week tour with Herman's Hermits. Woke up this morning feeling fine. And Tony Burris came to me just before we started that tour and said he'd been offered a solo contract with Decca. And Tony said that he was going to record this album, but he wanted to stay with the Kestrels to see what happened. That kind of knocked me sideways. By this time, I already had a contract with Mills Music as a writer, and I'd had a small success with a song called Everything in the Garden. And I figured maybe it was time for me to take a different path. So I said to the other guys, once we've finished a tour, I think as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to concentrate on my songwriting and maybe still do sessions. But as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of the Kestrels for me. And I felt really, really bad for Roger Cook, mainly because he'd moved his family up to London. He'd only been with us a couple of months and it was all breaking up again. And anyway, one day on about the last week of the tour with Herman's Hermits, Roger said, do you want to write a song? I said, sure. We'd never written together before. Oh, yeah. He had a ukulele and I had a ukulele and he played me the first couple of bars of You Got Your Troubles, I Got Mine. No lyrics, just a few bars he had in music. And I said, I like that. And in less than an hour, we came up with this. I see that worried look upon your face. You got your troubles, I've got mine. And Roger had come up with that lovely obligato line, which comes in the last verse, where it goes, da -de -da 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 -de -da -da, and I don't need no trouble for you. Roger came up with that, which was a stroke of genius. So we sat down, it took us one hour to finish the song, not knowing at the time that we'd just written our first big hit record. I see that worried look upon your face. You got your troubles. 
since I got mine. We had a break in the tour. And we went back to Mills Music and we went into Regent Sound Studios in Denmark Street. And by now, of course, Roger had been signed by Tony Hiller at Mills Music. And we recorded the demo of You Got Your Troubles, I've Got Mine. And then we went back on tour. I too have lost my love today. The tour finished. Kestrels hugged each other, shook hands, wished each other luck and went their separate ways. The first meeting we had with Roger and I when we went back to London off the tour was with Tony Hiller at Mills Music. And Tony said, sit down, guys. I've got something fantastic to play you. And he played us a version of You Got Our Troubles by a group called The Fortunes. You need some sympathy, well, so do I. You've got your troubles. I've got so now Roger and I had our first hit, You Got Your Troubles. Tony had not only played our demo disc of that song to the guy that produced the Fortunes record, Noel Walker at Decca, he played it to several other people as well, amongst whom was a guy called George Martin. Now everybody knows George Martin was the producer of the Beatles. And George said to Tony, I really like the song, but I like the sound that those two guys make. Do you think they'd be interested in working with me? And Tony said, well, I'm sure they would, and then we'll fix up a meeting. So we went along there and met George, who was a wonderful man. And he said, I really like that song a lot. And he said, and I like the way you sing it. I walked out of there and there was nothing under my feet, just air. I mean, I flew out of that office. It was wonderful. Judy Martin said, you need a name. You can't go out with Roger Cook, Roger Greenaway. She said, what about David and Jonathan? And I didn't know who David and Jonathan were, but apparently they were good friends in the Bible. So we went with David and Jonathan. The world knows this is big Roger and little Roger now, but it was David and Jonathan. And of course, we missed out, but you got your trouble. So George said to me, we got the album finished for us. So there's a song on there. He said, see if you can work it up. And he said, if you can get a nice sound and verse, and I'll record it with you. And that was Michelle. I want you, I want you, I want you. I think you know by now. Our record was a big hit in America. We got to number four in the American charts with Michelle. We had a few more hits with George. Uh, Lovers of the World Unite, of course. Lovers of the World Unite You alone know what is right Roger and I went out on the road as David and John. We did about 18 months on the road working clubs. And our third single, Softly Whispering I Love You, it wasn't a hit. It was, was sold quite well in California, but it wasn't a hit. But after about two years on the road, Roger and I said, we're not right much. Why don't we get off the road? Not making that much money. I thought, do you know, I've had enough of this. I had a family now, and we were concentrating more on the writing. I was running the publishing. We had our own publishing. And I decided it was time for me to concentrate on those, the business side of it and, and that we'd come off the road. So we did, and we concentrated on writing. And that turned out to be a, a very good decision. Very warm welcome back to the uh, Johnny Walker Show for this Wednesday lunchtime, and thanks for tuning in. Your company is indeed delightful. Well, I guess I first became aware of the songwriting talents of Cook and Greenaway with that Fortune song, You've Got Your Troubles. It was a, just a brilliant song, and that's what Cook and Greenaway managed to do, was to write great pop songs. And there's always some emotion in there. Both Rogers, Cook and Greenaway, they just had it in spades. They had that natural ability to write a great and memorable song. Everyone, welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio One. Welcome to the first of the Tony Backbone Show. So let's away. What makes Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway special is that they had a knack of writing very short, very memorable songs. When I was out on Radio Caroline, or indeed when I opened up Radio One and I was selecting the music for the breakfast shows, I was looking for that perfect pop song, the song that everybody would love to sing along with. The lifestyle in those years, it was so hectic. I mean, for five years... Roger Cook and I wrote 70 songs. We had lots of hits. We had a period of about two and a half years where we were never out of the charts in England. So 
it was pretty awesome. The great thing about uh, Cook and Greenaway, they didn't seem to be constrained about a way of doing things or how a song should sound. I think a lot of uh, songwriters do tend to write songs that you think, oh, that is definitely, definitely one of their songs. I mean, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, I love their music, but there's something about their songs that you know immediately it's a Burt Bacharach, Hal David song. But I think with Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway, their songs are so diverse. I mean, you've got your troubles, lovers of the world. Every song is slightly different. They don't have really their own sound, which I think is actually rather good. I mean, that something's gotten hold of my heart. What a brilliant song. Something's gotten hold of my heart Keeping my soul and my senses apart We were working up north somewhere, Roger and I. I think it was Sunderland. I sat down at the piano one day and started work on that. I took it into the studio to demo the song. I made a four-track demo of it, and four-track was real big in 1967. It was a good demo, real good demo. And Gene heard it and, of course, wanted to put it out. They went in the studio and tried to cut the song, just could never get the magic of my demo. So they called over and said, could we use the track of your demo and record it that way with Gene? I said, help yourself, buddy. So they took my demo, and that's the one you hear, Gene Pinton's version. But then you came my way And a feeling But then there were other songs that were completely different. Another big favourite of mine was the Andy Williams hit, Home Loving Man. We'd written this song with Tony McCauley, and I was about to embark on a trip to America. And I had an appointment with Andy Williams' producer, Dick Glasser. And I went into his office and I played him the song, and he said, yes, I, I really like that, that would be great for Andy. The problem is, Andy's got a single coming out with a Hank Mancini song from a movie, so it's going to be quite a while before we can record it. And he picked up the phone. I didn't know he was phoning Andy Williams on the golf course. He said, Andy, I want to play you something. So he played the demonstration of our song to Andy over the phone. And I heard him say, yes, 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 I like it, and that was it. We recorded the song at CBS Studios. I recorded my voice singing the melody so he could learn it as well. And I did the harmony, which to this day I'm still on the record. And then he put his voice on later. I got a call from Dick Lasseter to say the good news was that they decided they would still put the Hank Mancini song out, but it was going to be the B-side and Home Loving Man was going to be the A-side. And you can imagine how excited I was when I got back to London. I was able to tell Tony McCauley and Roger that we've got the next Andy Williams single. Wonderful feeling. Deep inside it's true, I'm a home loving man. Roger and I had so many hits in Europe that never crossed over into the United States at all. And, of course, vice versa. We had an American hit wasn't necessarily going to be a hit in England. We have another huge number one record here, which still gets played to death today, called Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress. The Hollies. I always loved Doctor's Orders by Sonny, a very catchy pop song. Silla Black's one that turned out to be a TV theme. Something tells me something's going to happen tonight. What a perfect song. What a one to set up the idea that something really good is on the way. Something tells me something's going to happen tonight. I got a call from Michael Hall, who was Silla's producer at BBC Television. And he said, we're about to embark on Scylla's second TV series. And he said, Scylla loves you guys. We were wondering if you'd be interested in writing the theme for the next series. And he said, well, why don't we meet up and I'll explain to you how I see the opening of the show going. So come on and make it, let's take everything that we've been dreaming of. He said, Scylla will be in silhouette at the back of the stage. She will walk forward. He said, and then when she gets to the mic, a pin spot will hit her head. The lights will all go up and everything has to happen. And it was at that moment when he said that, he gave me the title for the song. Something tells me something's gonna happen tonight. Everyone tried to get to Cook Green away. It was like a dream. 
Well, I worked on all the Blue Mean stuff. I was recording a session with Reg Presley of the Trogs, and on drums was Barry Morgan, on guitar was Alan Parker, on organ was Roger Coulom, and on bass was Herbie Flowers, all the top session musicians of the day. And during a break in the session, Barry Morgan, the drummer, came up to me and he said, Rog, he said, uh, the boys and I are going to form a new group. Would you be our lead singer? I said, I'm off the road now. I really, if you're intending to go out on the road, the answer basically is no. I said, but I'll tell you what, I know Roger Cook loves to sing. He lo- he'd love to get out on the road again, having finished with David and Jonathan. So they called me and they said, would you come in and do it? I said, yeah. But apparently they wrote a couple of songs and their so-called manager, a guy called Monty Babson, apparently said, to him, well, Roger Cook's a hit song. Why don't you get him to write a song for the band? So I did. I went away and sat down and wrote Melting Pot. One of my favourite bands got to be Blue Mink. It consisted of Madeline Bell, who is a, a black American singer. The guys in Blue Mink were the best that you could get. One day I got a call from Roger Coulomb to say, Roger Cook had written this song and would I come along and do it? So, walked into the studio, Morgan Studios in Wilsdon, and did three takes went into the control box to listen to it back and one of the guys said this is a really great track shall we put it out as a single november 1969 it was released and by christmas it was number three in the charts we could not believe it I'm Alan Parker, I'm a musician and a composer, and I was also very fortunate to be the lead guitarist in Blue Mink. I used to see Cookie, like a lot of the guys, you know, used to do session work. A few of us sort of said, this is crazy, we're back at everybody, we should make a record of our own. And suddenly we get a phone call, you've gone into the charts. Total and utter disbelief. Melting Pot's been banned anyway, so... The Blue Mink song Melting Pot has been banned by Ofcom. It has featured on radio stations all over the world since its release 50 years ago, but the media regulator received a complaint about offensive language after the 1969 hit was played on a commercial radio station. It was written for a very specific reason to bring all peoples together and that was the message behind it. Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway's idea was this is making everybody the same. I want to use all those slang names. In the end it turned out to be a bad deal because the record got banned. Oh, wow. Blue Mink had come out with this great song called Good Morning Freedom. I adapted as a sort of a jingle to open up my Radio 1 show at 9 o'clock. Good morning, world, it's a brand new day. Good Morning Freedom, yeah, it became a big hit. It kind of cemented our position. And then, of course, we had Our World, Banner Man. Bannerman was fun. I remember they were laying the track and there was no lyrics, so I had to go out into the coffee bar. And while they were laying the track... I was writing the lyric out. Took about half an hour. We were on such a roller coaster. If we weren't in the studio, we were on the road. It snowballed for us. We did all the clubs up north. It never was intended, but we would be working up in Liverpool or Manchester and we'd come off stage and of the six of us, it might be four of us, had to come back to London for a session at 10 o'clock in the morning. So we were up and down the M1. We burnt rubber like you wouldn't believe. We worked our butts off, all of us, during that four and a half years that Blue Mink was together. We traveled a lot. We did the Troubadour. Yeah, we did so much in that four and a half years that we were together and that we were never intending to be a working band. Stay with me, lay with me, love me for longer than just your goodbye. The interesting thing about Blue Mink is that they don't have a distinctive sound, really. We treated each song as a standalone. They didn't want to sound like the last record that we put out. But then that's, if you know Roger Cook, then you know that's the way he writes as well. He doesn't write stuff that sounds like something else that he wrote. And we had multi-talented musicians in the band, so everybody had some kind of input. All these songs, they've got a different sound to them, but they do have that wonderful Madeline Bell and Cook voice, and their voices go so well together. If there was an identifying sound, it was always Madeline and I singing together. I think we had a good sound together. But I think if you hark back to the Beatles, it was the voices that identified who they were more than what the band played.
when I look at the list of songs that they've written, I realize I've loved them all <laughs> for all these years. And they still stand the test of time. And Cook and Greenaway are really diverse in their own careers, really. I mean, they're not just songwriters, although they're brilliant songwriters. They wrote commercials. Yeah, we did hundreds of commercials, turning them out, you know, one a week. Everybody wanted us. I've still got a commercial on there. I did in 1975, the Asda commercial, you know. Dun, 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 bum, bum. That was written in 1975, and it's still on air today. You know, in the days of radio, I was still at the BBC. I was at Radio 1. But then along comes Capital Radio. But the thing that made Capital Radio stand out was their jingle package created by Cook and Greenaway. So, Capital helps you make it through, Capital through the night. And Roger did, isn't it good to know, Capital Radio, you can turn on a friend, you can turn on a show, you can turn on the world with Capital Radio, such a good way to make your day. Capital sounds go round and round, London town, yabba da ba da ba da that's blooming, all of that's blooming. And then when you want to come up with a record that's really going to move things and maybe be adopted in some form of advertising, and you come up with, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, what a wonderful idea. Well, it was a song that was written as a jingle, a 28-second and 58-second jingle. We first started writing for Coke through the fortunes in, in America, and I kept in touch with Bill Backer especially, and we continued to write other commercials for them for a period of about five years, working with people like Ray Charles. Things go better with the Coca-Cola yeah, now. The Vogues. Although the cold wind is blowing, soon now the spring what would happen is they would call us fix a date for us either to go to new york or they would come to london and on this occasion they were coming to london we were about to write commercials for the the new seekers bill backer was the main man and billy davis billy davis arrived on the saturday unfortunately bill backer his flight was caught in a storm he was diverted to Ireland and Roger was up north somewhere with Blue Mink so Billy and I met about 10 o'clock in the morning at our offices in Park Street and sat down with my little ukulele and I played him a melody that Roger Cook and I had started on holiday in Portugal we had about 16 bars so I played him this melody and Billy said yeah, yeah great melody we'll, yeah we'll work on that and about two hours later we'd finished a song called True Love and Apple Pie and it went something like this Promise me no diamond rings or castles in the sky. Cause all I need is your true love, true love, an apple pie. The next we had fixed to meet again the next day in the offices and Bill Backer was in this time and Roger was down. I couldn't stay. But anyway, we'd had true love and apple. I was finished as far as I was concerned and it was just a question of playing it to Bill Backer and Roger. And Bill Backer said to Billy, the melody's fine, Billy, there's nothing wrong with the melody, but the lyric's never going to work for Coca-Cola. The only thing good about that song was the melody. It was a very catchy melody. So he, Billy and Roger Cook, changed True Love and Apple Pie into I Like to Teach the World to Sing. I do remember being in the room downstairs at Air London and the four of us walking up and down with our heads in our hands, you know. In space of about an hour and a half, we knocked that thing out, just a short jingle. And we got paid, and that was the end of that. I'm David Mackay. I'm a record producer, arranger, and composer. I got a phone call from Roger Greenway saying, would I pop into his office? And he said, I've got a jingle I want to play you. And he got his little ukulele out, and he sang probably the first three or four lines of I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing. And at the time, I had my first hit record in America, which was The New Seekers. Look what you've done to my song, Ma. And... Roger said, look, this is going to be a Coca-Cola jingle, and we wanted to have that sort of atmosphere, that feel that you've got in that song. It was just purely a jingle. There was no thought about it at that stage being a song. And the jingle went out on radio and just didn't do much at all, actually. There was no basic reaction to it whatsoever. It stayed on air for as long as it needed to and then came off. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow up about nine months later, 
Bill Backer was in the office one day and a guy called Harvey Gabor, who did all the TV commercials for Coca-Cola, he went into Bill and he said, Bill, I've got this idea, TV commercial with lots of young men and women stood on a hill with a Coke bottle in their hands, raised up to the sky, and I need a song that's anthemic to go with that vision. And he said, is there anything you can remember that you've recorded over the last four or five years you think might fit the bill? And Bill said, frankly, I can't remember, but there's the library, go in and run through them. So Harvey was in the studios for about three days, and on the third afternoon he came out, he said, I've found it, he was waving the tape in his hands. And Bill Becker said, what is it you found? He said, I'd like to teach the world to sing by the New Seekers. The New Seekers, buy in the world a Coke. And it was that video that really broke the song apart. They started showing it on TV, and thousands of people were writing into Coca-Cola and saying, where can we buy that song? Can we get the tune? Can we get sheep music? New commercial for Coca-Cola sparks great consumer response. Rare is the commercial which stirs listeners or viewers to write to corporate offices praising the words or music or copy theme. I'd like to buy the world a Coke, latest in the It's the Real Thing campaign for world-famous brand Coca-Cola, is just such a commercial. Over 90% of the letters received by the company, agency, and brand people at Coca-Cola USA have requested copies of the lyrics. One teacher who wrote in wants to write a play around the commercial's theme for her high school class. So they realized they had something special. Fortunately, the New Seekers were playing at the Regency Hotel in New York. So Billy Davis was able to run them quickly into the studios and get the song recorded for commercial release. Billy Davis booked a studio for us in New York for the Sunday. We mixed it that afternoon and that evening cut the actual master. They raced it out and I think within about 10 days we were in the charts and it just went ballistic. I remember one day in London, we sold 99,000 singles in one day. Now, there was another group who had taken it off the television and recorded it, a group called the Hillside Singers. And those records went out, and in America, they competed with each other, going up the charts, which doesn't happen very often. And the New Seekers came out on top, of course. And in England, they, I think they were number one for about six weeks. I'd like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. The very short record, it's only about two minutes long. The song was there. It was basically recorded exactly the same way as we did the commercial, except we didn't put Coca-Cola in there. So it was easy. It was just a question of reproducing the jingle without Coca-Cola being mentioned. I'll tell you the story with Teach Will Sing. Even Roger doesn't know this. When it came out, I had the job of plugging it. So I took it over to the B, lot snobbery on it. It's a jingle, isn't it? And I came back, I thought, well, I don't know if this is going to work. You know, they don't seem to like it. Then I rang out the factory for the sales figures and he said, oh, we sold 30,000 today. And I thought, it's going to be a hit. It's bound to be, isn't it? And in the end, they had to play it. The sales were phenomenal. When I first played I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing, the reaction from the audience was tremendous, you know. Everybody loved it. It's just such a joyous song, and it can be sung by anybody. If you wanted to put across a message of everybody getting together and be happy, that is the song. It's just a happy song. It's a brilliant song, and it just makes you feel good every time you listen to it. That's the power of their songs and their appeal to people all over the world and also to give people all over the world a dream of how things could be when we all sing together in perfect harmony. If they only ever wrote one song, that one would justify their partnership. Brilliant song. I'm Katie Cook. I'm a television presenter and a singer-songwriter, and I'm also Roger Cook's daughter. I'm Gavin Greenaway. I'm a pianist, composer, and conductor, and my dad is Roger Greenaway. My childhood was filled with music, thanks to my dad and all of his wonderfully talented friends and co-writers like Roger Greenaway. Of course, I didn't know any different because I was a child. I didn't understand how different my upbringing was to others, but I would just say my childhood was full of creativity, and it's had a huge impact on me. I'm extremely grateful to have been around so many creative people growing up. I was aware that my dad wrote songs and occasionally was on TV on top of the pops or whatever, but it all seemed quite normal to me. I suppose you get used to whatever your family life is like, and you assume that that's kind of the norm. 
then of course people would pop round and you'd go oh is that cliff richard at the front door but you know since mum and dad just took it in their stride i thought well that's obviously quite normal i can remember driving down the motorway when we were kids all in the back and dad's humming away at something and he says to mum quick 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 t- turn the recorder on and she's got to turn the little mini cassette recorder on and he'll sing into it and then a few miles down the road it, there'll be another bit that he's put down I like to teach the world to sing. Obviously, I was a baby when it came out, but it's been such a big part of my life because everywhere I go, people will say, oh, I sang that in school growing up. And I'm talking about people from around the world. I think literally in every country of the world, at some point, a child learned to sing that song. And when it came out, before long, word somehow you know, gets around everyone at school knew that he'd written it and I sort of was a bit bemused I'm not sure I really knew how to handle it as a seven eight year old the attention that was pointed towards us I remember when we were at school and the club advert came out if you like a lot of chocolate on your biscuit join our club that one and of course all the kids in in the playground were singing it because it's very catchy and uh, I didn't let on that he'd written that because I, I didn't want any more attention. I just wanted to get on with my schoolwork and have a nice quiet life. There was one time we were watching Top of the Pops and they weren't just on once. They were just so big. At one point, I think Cook and Greenaway were getting almost as many cuts as Lennon McCartney. I mean, it was just crazy how, how successful they were. But you wouldn't really know that to just be at home with Dad. <laughs> We'd been involved with making what we call group records and make-up groups. Tony was on Edison Lighthouse. And he and I had also recorded a, a thing called Gimme That Ding. Gimme, gimme, gimme that ding. And both he and I had recorded with White Plains, My Baby Loves Loving. And he and I and Sue and Sonny and a guy called Johnny Goodison would also recorded a song called United We Stand at Brotherhood of Man. And this one evening, all four acts were on top of the pops. It's never happened before, and it will never happen again. A month later, we'd been in the studios and recorded another song called Lady Pearl, and we'd called that group Current Craze, 2Ks. And Stanley Dorfman rang me. We love Lady Pearl, Roger, he said, and we'd like the group on top of the pops next week. Can you give me the name of the band for the contract? Well, it's Roger Cook. And he said, well, stop there. I said, what do you mean stop there? He said, it's not you guys again, is it? I said, yes, it is. He said, Roger, I can't use you. He said, you would not believe the number of letters we get complaining about you guys after that four-act fiasco on top of the pops a month ago. And he said, I've had a word from on high. And they said, we mustn't use you again. And I told Roger Cook, and he said, you know, if we were in America we'd be being fated for our success. And here, because we're successful, we're being denigrated. He said, I don't want to be here anymore. And that's what eventually drove him to leave the UK and go and work in America. I was just disillusioned with uh, where we were headed. I want to go somewhere else and do something different. I want to get out of this little pigeonhole I'm in. and, And so I decided to go to the States. It was a shock for me. And I said, I wish you all the best. Go with my blessing. I was 35 years old and I wanted to go and do something totally different. So I ended up going up to New York and living there for about five months. And I loved that town. If I'd have been single, I might have stayed there. But I went to L.A. then for six weeks and thought, no, this is not my town either. And somebody said, why don't you go to Nashville? I said, why would I go to Nashville? I don't like country music. They said, you'll love the musicians in the studios. So I came up to Nashville for a week, and that was 46 years ago. Funnily enough, it was after that that I got to do something which was, was for me, another a dream, a lifetime dream. And that was to work with the Drifters and Johnny Moore. Roger Greenaway's hero was the Drifters because he could sing like them. Oh, yeah, they were his idols. Roger Greenaway was responsible, really, for bringing the Drifters back. Hi, my name is Tina Treadwell. I'm daughter of George and Faye Treadwell, the legendary music managers who were behind the Drifters. My mother met Roger Greenaway shortly after she moved the Drifters to the UK in 1972. The interesting thing about Roger Greenaway, he was a legendary songwriter and he wrote in a style that completely fit with the Drifters brand. They were beautiful melodies and just a part of the lexicon of what made the Drifters great. My sister and brother will wave to each other 
This is Butch Leak. I joined the Drifters back in early 1970 through 1976. Roger Greenway was a Drifter fan. That was a marriage made in heaven, basically. <laughs> Your mama says that through the week you can't go out with me. But when the weekend comes around, she knows where we will be. He nailed it right on the head. You can identify with them, and the guy with the girl, and, you know, <laughs> kissing in the back row, which was one of the favorites. Funny enough, Johnny Moore, he didn't like that song at all. And I'm in the box, and Johnny comes in from the studio, and he says, I don't think I can sing this song. He said, I'm a 45-year-old man, Roger. I can't sing lines like, when her homework's done, and I can't pick her up from school. <laughs> I said, you know what? I said, I see what you mean. But Johnny, the audience, won't care about the lyric. They're hearing Johnny Moore singing in the Johnny Moore style, and this song's going to be a hit. Now, that was a very foolish thing to say to an artist. Johnny said, OK, I will sing the song, which he did, and the rest is history. He got a massive hit with Kissing in the Back Row of the Movies. After that, he always said, I won't question you in future. You're the doctor. He called me the doctor. And he never, ever questioned anything I asked him to do after that. Roger Greenway, he was, of course, a perfectionist. He was a, a real great, great guy, very talented. He knew his stuff. Songs like, There Goes My First Love. There goes my first love What the guy used to call my friend I grew up listening to Drifter's records, and I revered that sound. There's no question about it. Johnny Moore, he's up there with the great, great pop singers. I've never worked with anybody who was so professional and just got it. All I did was about four takes with him and I just mixed between the four or used one take. He was the absolute wonderful singer to work with. And to this day, I think you'll find fans love that voice. When you listen to the songs that Roger Greenaway wrote for the Drifters in the 70s, they are completely reminiscent of the spirit of Under the Boardwalk or There Goes My Babies. He must have had a love for the Drifters' sound because you can hear it reminiscent in the songs and the hits that he created. Because he believed in the Drifters and he put together the magic that made us for that period. There's no doubt about that, you know. He was the man. <laughs> if I had to pick a time that was, for me, something that I could say, yeah, I'm really proud of that, the Drifters would be it. To get them after such a long time, first of all, to work with Johnny Moore, and then to get them back in the charts and then have five wonderful years working with them. It's a dream for me. These were classic hits that were all top ten, that make you happy, that everyone can relate to, everyday experiences, everyday emotions, coupled with the richness of their melodies. I still think that these are the things that drew audiences from around the world to the music, like Moths to a Flame. And for that, I'm very grateful. They've both got such different stories to tell. I've never known two people in some ways are so bloody different because little Roger's very organised and big Roger just thinks everything will be fine. I think my father felt like he needed to move to Nashville to really continue to be creative. I think he felt like he had done everything he could do in London. I arrived in Nashville and immediately I got a buzz. And if you saw my home in Tennessee, Tennessee, that's where you'd be. Funny enough, my choice of Nashville in the end meant I really meant nothing much in this town. I hadn't had a country hit. People were very respectful about the pop hits I'd had, but without a country hit, you know, I really wasn't, I had no weight in this town. My family went along with whatever I went along with at that time. I had three children in England, and my wife, of course, my long-suffering wife, Joan, at that time, she was prepared to move with me. She could see it meant a lot to me, 
And she came over. I think she enjoyed the adventure too, and so did the kids. My dad, when he gets an idea in his head, I mean, you just line up behind him and you go. I think everyone just trusted that he had this vision, and I think he said, yeah, "All right, Joan, pack up. <laughs> We're moving." And I'm sure she was like, "What?" But she loved him and believed in him. And you know, let's face it, he had been so successful in a lot of ways. It's so beautiful. It was kind of the American dream. You pick up and you move out into the country and figure out. How to make your way? There was something very romantic about that time, and I think it really got my dad's creative juices flowing. It was a thrill. I thought, I'm home. I'm home. I'm happy. That's my home, sweet Tennessee. I don't know if they fully knew what they were getting into. When they packed up and moved here, it was a lot more difficult than just putting all of your <laughs> things on a boat and it taking months to reach you. Again, looking back, I, I definitely wouldn't change a thing, but that doesn't mean it was easy. It was not easy. Yeah, it was. I was struggling for a couple of years. My songs had too much British content in the way. But yeah, the first two years, I thought I was just going to sit down. How hard could it be to write a a simple melody? A simple lyric, three chords. How hard could it be to get a hit? Well, after two years, I knew it wasn't easy. That first hit changed everything. Suddenly, we had a future here, you know, a real future. Three o'clock in the morning, and it looks like it's gonna be another sleepless night. I'm Crystal Gale, and I have recorded many of Roger Cook's songs, including his first country hit. Talking in your sleep. You've been talking in your sleep, sleeping in your dreams. When I first met Roger Cook, of course I was a big fan. You know, I loved his style, just the way he would write and the way he was as a person. Roger Cook is still so special, and I love being with him. When I recorded "Talking in Your Sleep," it was a song that appealed to me because I love ballads. You know, it's one of my big number ones. It's a, a great song. Talking in your sleep with loving on your mind. When Roger would send me a song, drop me a tape off, or just get his guitar out or ukulele <laughs> and sing it to me, you know it was going to be great. I love the meaning of the songs. That Roger wrote. Hi, I'm Billy Prine. I'm a big fan of a man named Roger Cook. They broke the mold, as they say. Okay, when they made Rogers, one of the greatest songwriters in the world. Rogers written a lot of great songs. I believe in you by Don Williams, which to me is probably one of the greatest country love songs ever written. I don't believe in superstars, organic food, and foreign cars. It was validation. It meant that somebody is good with such a great image. Don had a wonderful image. He cut a few of my songs before he cut. I believe in you. It meant I'd arrived in town anyway. He wouldn't sing. Sometimes I don't give a damn. He wouldn't sing "damn" in the lyric. He's an old-fashioned Texas man. He wouldn't do that. So he came up with. Sometimes I wonder who I am, which is a pretty weak line. But it was Don Williams, so I let him get away with it. And I believe in you. Just a thrill to hear that voice singing my song. Also, I'd heard one song, John Prine's, before I came to America, and I just thought, wow, I'd love to meet that guy one day. And we became really good friends, really good friends. And started writing together, and we wrote dozens and dozens of songs together. Him and my brother John, my late brother John, wrote two number one hits. Love is on a roll, love is on a good roll. I remember the party we had at the Hermitage Hotel in '83. It was, it was a big bash. It was great. My brother's first number one hit, and he co-wrote it with Roger Cook. And then I just want to dance with you by George Strait. That came out in the late '90s. I don't want to be the kind to hesitate, be too shy, way too 
late. I regard Roger Cook as not only one of the greatest songwriters, also an all-star great personality. When you are a great writer, a great singer, people want to be around you, and that is why he had so much success in Nashville. Because this is a very hard community to break into, and the quality of songwriting here is off the charts, and didn't matter what songs he had written before he came here. He had to prove himself in this community, and he has done it with such quality music. To take on a totally different medium and pull it off was great. What a thrill. Probably the biggest thrill I've ever had. I just want to dance with you. Roger Greenaway not only is a great songwriter and a great singer on all these hit records, is a great administrator. Back in 1977, I became a director member of the Performing Rights Society. And in 82, the then chairman, Richard Toman, asked me if I would follow him as chairman. So in, in 1983, I became chairman of the PRS. I talked to friends in the music industry in Australia, and he's the one person who will fight for the rights of the songwriters. He's done an amazing amount of work for an amazing amount of people. The songwriters in this country owe him, from the Beatles everywhere, everybody that's written hit songs in this country, they owe a lot to Roger Greenway for the fight he's put up for their rights. The weight around your neck as a child of a famous anything is that are you going to go into the same profession? You might not recognize the name, Gavin Greenaway, but there's a good chance you've heard his music. He's an Emmy Award winning British film score conductor. Well, Gavin and, and I worked on a couple of TV series, a couple of cartoon TV series like uh, Family Ness, Jimbo in the Jet Set and uh, Penny Crown. We spent many happy hours. It was fun working with him. What nicer thing for a father and his son to get together and do the things that they love and at the same time make a living. Roger Cook, he continued to write more. He's a habitual writer. He writes every day. I write as much as I've ever written. I write at least two songs a week. And I've done that for 55 years, so there's still a lot of original songs to be written. He's always writing with people, or he's playing golf. A lot of times I call him, he's on his way to the golf course, or he's on his way to a writing appointment. Age hasn't slowed him down at all. I love writing with other people. I write a lot of songs by myself, but I like writing with other people because it's a social thing. Hi, my name's Johnny Lucas, and I'm an alternative rock artist based here in Nashville, but originally I'm from England. And I met Roger Cook when I first moved here to Nashville and we've been writing for the last five years and it's brilliant. We sure could use a blue sky up above today, you say. When I first came here and started writing with him, like people were like, oh my goodness, you're writing with Roger Cook. Well, you're in safe hands then. His name around town, Roger Cook, is Nashville royalty. Cook and Greenaway had so many awards. Ivan Avello awards mean a tremendous amount to a songwriter chosen by other songwriters. So those are the awards that are special. To get that is something very, very special. And I've got six... 71, 72, when we were back-to-back songwriters of the year, you know. It was pretty awesome. It is absolutely incredible. That shows their brilliance. Amazing news coming into us this morning as Bristol's Roger Cook has become the first Englishman to be inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. But for me, being a Brit and getting into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in Nashville, that was a big deal. That was a... It has been accepted. And it shows the respect that Nashville has for Roger. They've all just taken their arms and embraced Roger, and I think that is so wonderful. What an honor. I mean, that's fantastic, and he deserves it. I mean, completely. Music news this afternoon, and the Bristol songwriting duo of Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway are to be celebrated tonight as they're inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in New York. It was a magnificent occasion, of course. Roger and I were there both together. That's a big deal, you know. I mean, you're there with all those famous, wonderful names. So, uh, yeah, we all flew over to New York, mum, dad, my brother, my sister, myself, and we went to the ceremony in the evening where Clint Black performed Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress and then the two Rogers sung uh, You've Got Your Troubles. It went in a flash. It was too quick, but it was something I'll never forget. It was probably the proudest moment of my life. And to think, wow, we're here, we've done it. 
We've done the big one. Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway, the songs that they turned out, they will live forever. So one time for CMT, I actually got to interview Def Leppard because they were doing a big show with Taylor Swift. And of course, you know, being from England, you know, we were talking about England a little bit. And I I happened to say to Joe Elliott, yeah, well, you know, my dad's a songwriter. He said, okay, who's that? I said, that is Roger Cook from Blue Mink. And he went, oh, my God, I listen to Bannerman all the time. And I was like, what? Def Leppard? You you listen to Bannerman? Like, this is so crazy right now. Not the song I thought you were going to call out, but okay. <laughs> Whenever you get one of your old songs and somebody else does them, I mean, it's a real buzz. Now, put that into the range of Cook and Greenway with their catalogue. They must have very happy bank managers. <laughs> I had a promotion company as well. One of my artists was Mark Allman. Welcome return for Mark Allman and Gene Pitney singing together. They got to number one and stayed there for four weeks. Something's got a hold of my heart. I will tell you this too. I got so many calls when Mad Men ended and they use I Like to Teach the World to Sing. My phone started blowing up. Is your dad watching Mad Men? I was like, what? Why? No, I have no idea. And the great thing about that song, like here in America, they sing it in school. Kids sing it. In fact, there's a few churches here that sing the words of Amazing Grace to the tune of I Like to Teach the World to Sing. I do sing it when I go out live and play. And I always end with, I like to teach the world to sing. And when I get to that, the place nearly always erupts. And they start clapping along. And I think, well, Roger, you can't escape this song. This song's with you forever. I'd like to buy the world a home. Cook and Greenaway song had something really extra. There's a magic in the air when the two of them are together. Cook and Greenaway, they were on the heels of Lennon and McCartney as far as songwriting was concerned. They've done so much for the world of popular music. And it takes talent, and they both have it. With Roger and I, we never fell out of love. We're still good friends, we always will be. He was my dear friend, of course, and still is. Roger Cook is the genius. It doesn't know he's a genius. So I bless him forever. He's he's Saint Roger for me. Sing it with me one time. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. And there you go. Yeah. 